The crisp morning air embraced me as I tightened the straps on my backpack, preparing for our daring patrol into the uncharted territory of Yellowstone National Park. I was part of a team of park rangers who was tasked with exploring the untouched depths of the wilderness, mapping new trails and ensuring the safety of both visitors and wildlife. With a mixture of excitement and caution, we set off into the dense forest, the towering trees forming a majestic canopy above us. Each step echoed through the serene silence, our boots crushing twigs and leaves beneath them. The beauty of nature surrounded us, but so did the untamed mysteries that lay hidden within. As we ventured deeper into the wilderness, our senses sharpened, our eyes scanning the surroundings for any signs of disturbance. Suddenly, a faint cry broke through the stillness of the forest. We exchanged glances, our instincts alerting us to something amiss. Following the anguished sound, we stumbled upon an injured camper, his face etched with pain and fear. Blood stained his clothes, and his trembling hands clutched a makeshift bandage over a deep gash on his arm. We rushed to his side, offering assistance and asking what had befallen him. His voice quivered as he recounted his terrifying encounter. He described a creature, massive and hairy, with eyes that seemed to penetrate his very soul. It resembled the Bigfoot, a creature often dismissed as folklore. Skepticism flickered in our eyes, but empathy compelled us to listen further. The injured camper revealed how the creature attacked him without warning, its strength overwhelming. He fought back with all his might, desperately struggling to free himself from its grip. In a stroke of desperation, he managed to strike a blow that sent the beast sprawling. Believing it to be dead, he escaped, but the trauma had clouded his memory of the exact location. Our gazes shifted between disbelief and concern. Could it be possible? Were we standing face to face with evidence of a creature? We assessed the situation, weighing our duty to the injured camper against the unknown dangers that lurked in the depths of the park. Realizing that his life hung in the balance, we made a collective decision to prioritize his well-being. Carefully, we helped him to his feet, supporting his wounded arm. Navigating through the wilderness, our group communicated with a local hospital, arranging for an immediate transfer of the injured camper. The journey was arduous. We formed a protective shield around him, ensuring his safety as we traversed the untamed terrain. Finally reaching the edge of the wilderness, we handed him over to the waiting medical professionals. Exhausted, yet satisfied that we had fulfilled our duty, we watched as he was whisked away to receive the urgent care he needed. Though skeptical of his encounter, we couldn't shake off the nagging curiosity that lingered within us. I work as a broadcast engineer. One night in September 2015, I received a phone call around 9.30, 10-ish p.m. from the on-duty engineer that our OTA over-the-air signal had gone out and we were off the air on our OTA platform. The call was with several other engineers as well as my boss at the time. We figured out that the problem was at our transmitter and must be corrected manually. My boss asked for someone to volunteer to go with him, and after a few seconds of awkward silence I offered. So our RF transmitter site was located on top of Beacon Mountain in Beacon, New York which was about an hour plus from our station. At the time, I had never been up there so going in the middle of the night was a little spooky. I met my boss and we drove together, got to the mountain a little before midnight. The road up the mountain to the transmitter site is a long, narrow, windy and steep dirt road with a lot of big loose rocks, so the drive up and down is scary enough. I can't emphasize enough how dark this drive was. Like pitch black. A few times while going up we would see headlights coming towards us of people out with their off-road jeeps. Which wouldn't be as weird if it weren't the middle of the night. We also saw two different campfires deep in the woods which I just assumed were groups of locals hanging out drinking. My boss told me that locals hung out near the transmitter site sometimes and should be avoided as they had a tendency to be sketchy. It didn't seem too sketchy to me, but what did I know, it was my first time there. 
My boss also told me that he never travels to that mountain without a gun. He said it's more than the locals. I've seen stuff out here I can't really explain. We get to the top, do our work on our transmitter, close everything up, and start to head back down. As we were heading down, we were at a particularly steep part of the road when you have to ride your brake because the car won't stop till the incline levels out a little. All of a sudden, three deer sprint out in front of us, not even looking at our oncoming car causing us to swerve since we were already riding the brake. The front of the car hit a rock which stopped our momentum. My boss instantly turned the car off and once the sound of the engine died we heard something big run the opposite direction away from the road up the natural slope of the hill. I shined my flashlight in the direction but whatever it was was already out of sight. We could still see branches moving and leaves settling from being disturbed by whatever ran away. I asked my boss if he thought that was another deer or possibly a bear and he replied, Bears run on all fours, whatever that was ran on two legs. And bears don't hunt deer, something was chasing them. When we first heard the footsteps, I would estimate they were as close as 10-15 feet from the car when it started to run away, but appeared to be standing over us, as there was a natural incline up the mountain. There are a few logical explanations like that my boss was just trying to scare me or that it was a local walking, running through the woods, but here are a few things to consider. Yes, it could have been a person walking alone through the woods, but why chase the deer? And why run away from the car? Also, whatever ran away was out of sight quickly, like within three, four seconds of starting to run up the hill. This person would have to be in the greatest shape ever to run that quickly up this hill. This also sounded way too big to be a bobcat, mountain lion, or coyote. My boss is not the kind of guy that would try to scare people. He's a very stern all-business type of guy. He seemed pretty rattled by this and wanted to get off the mountain ASAP. He later confided in me that he thought it may have been a Bigfoot. I ended up going back up that mountain many more times before leaving for a new job, and I never saw or heard anything like that night. However, I never went back after sunset. I no longer work for this company, and this company no longer owns the transmitter site, so I will likely never have a reason to go back. I don't know of any reported sightings or experiences in the area, but I do know that over the years there have been many car accidents on that road. I assume all the accidents are due to the poor condition of it, but honestly, I have no idea. The year was 1970. I worked for Caltrans as a right-of-way agent for the state of California. I was taking some legal documents over to Bakersfield to have a county judge sign. I was traveling on Route 58 west of Mojave towards Bakersfield and east of Tehachapi in my 1957 Chevrolet State Car. A state highway maintenance crew was repairing the westbound lanes. Traffic was stopped in these two lanes for up to 15 minutes. I pulled right off of the highway to a dirt and gravel turnout and backed up to a low-level brush and rock area with no dirt roads behind me. I sat in the car for a few minutes and decided to take a look at the documents I was taking to Bakersfield for the judge. Before I got the documents out, I noticed something in my rear view's mirror and turned to see what it was. I was amazed to see a vehicle directly behind my car with two individuals wearing grey-white suits. Mine was the only car on the turnout. No car could have possibly gone around the front or the back without me seeing or hearing it. There was no sound at all. I continued to look directly at the car and individuals directly through the back window. The car was maroon in color with a dark top. The grille looked similar to an older Buick. The license plate was light in color with no discernible markings. The two individuals in the car as stated wore jump type suits with no buttons. They were slender with no visible hat or hair and their bodies appeared to be smaller than the average sized man. Their eyes were very dark and semi-oval, little larger than a normal human. They stared at me and never blinked. They both had two small holes for their nose, very small mouths, no lips and I couldn't see any ears. 
nor could I see their arms due to their car hood hiding over half of their bodies. After a few minutes of staring at each other, I noticed light traffic starting to slowly move on the highway again to the west, so I drove from my parking area out to the paved highway going towards Backersfield again. The highway's westbound lanes were now open for the public. I was driving about normal speed in the right-hand lane, just west of where the state construction was. Looking to my left I saw a maroon car driving at my speed, parallel to me with the same individuals I had seen at the turnout. The driver looked continuously to the front. I immediately noticed that he had no nose and he was bald. The passenger in the car was again staring directly at me. We drove parallel to each other for about 15 seconds. I didn't know what to do, so I waved my hand at them as if to say goodbye. They immediately sped down the highway and disappeared around a moderate curve to the right. I sped up to try and see the maroon car again, but it had disappeared. There were rather steep rock cliffs on the right side and no place to turn off the highway. The next day driving from Bakersfield to Bishop, I stopped at the same turnout of my first encounter and went to the same spot. I saw my tire tracks from the previous day but saw no other tracks behind mine. Wow, as you might deduce I've never breathed a word of these happenings for decades to anyone for fear of being ridiculed. I've mulled over this experience many times over the years. This is my true story of a very strange, mysterious, and profound event. Lately, I've been seeing a lot more stories on Reddit about Yaoi sightings and encounters. So I myself was driving home one evening and saw something that disturbed me to my core. Myself and two fellow officers were driving down this country road towards the station. It was maybe right about one in the morning after a very long shift. The roads can be pretty dangerous sometimes, and we're always on high alert for anything out of the ordinary. We spotted something up ahead near an old abandoned building, so we slowed down to see what it was. It was the movement that caught our eye. As we got closer, I realized it was not any animal we'd ever seen. It was tall, bipedal, hairy, with big eyes, and had claws like a bear. But it clearly was not a bear. But like a bear, it also stood upright. It was just standing there, looking right at us. It did not have any clothes on either, so I was pretty rattled. We pulled up about several hundred feet away, stopped to get a better look at it. We knew this wasn't one of the new aliens they're always talking about. This was something else. Though I will admit, we're all fairly seasoned officers, this thing really spooked us. Enough that one of my fellow officers turned around right then, drove off without saying anything to me or my other friend. He must have had his reasons that he took off. While we were still in the process of trying to find out what happened, this thing began making strange sounds. We'd try to get a closer look, but we felt too afraid to get closer. I feel like had we gotten out of the car and gone up the hill to where this was, whatever that thing was, it would have attacked us. Was it a yaoi? It just had this sort of dangerous demeanor about it. So we decided to leave it. Instead, I'm kind of glad my partner took off. I think he knew something I did not back then. I know for sure now, though. Cryptids are real, and yaoi is one of them for sure. In fact, my childhood friend saw another one years ago in the forest near his home. Once we were young teenagers, he's been trying to convince me ever since that all those other stories we've heard are probably true. I guess we know that he was right about at least some of them. I don't know what's going on, but I'm glad to see there are others out there like me and my friend who believe in these creatures and are not afraid to speak out about it. It's time we get the word out that they are real. People need to recognize this kind of thing is happening every day all around us, even if most people can't see it or just simply refuse to accept it. That and stop perpetuating the stories and rumors about Sasquatch and Bigfoot being demons or something. We know better than that by now, right? I'm Akita, Sioux native that had this terrifying encounter with an unknown predator. 
so I grew up in the heart of the Appalachians, near a dense and mysterious woodland. My closest companion in this wilderness was Red Bull, a fearless and adventurous friend who shared my curiosity for the unknown. One fateful day, after a successful bison hunt, Red Bull and I decided to venture deeper into the woods in search of the carcass we had left behind. As we made our way through the underbrush, a sudden chill swept through the forest, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. I exchanged a wary glance with Red Bull, both of us sensing an eerie presence lurking nearby. The familiar sounds of the woods seemed to fade into an unnatural silence. Then we saw it. Emerging from the darkness was a figure unlike anything we had ever encountered. It stood tall on its two hind legs, its elongated arms brushing against the ground like a bear in disguise. The creature's gaunt frame gave an impression of extreme malnourishment, with a crooked spine that contorted its form. Its face was a grotesque sight, lacking the majestic horns of a bull, but adorned with a tangled mane of neck hair. Its skin, bathed in the ethereal glow of moonlight, shimmered with a haunting gray hue, and its eyes glowed with an unnatural, piercing light. My heart pounded in my chest as I locked eyes with this monstrous cryptid. Its presence sent a shiver down my spine, and I could feel the weight of its gaze penetrating my very soul. In sheer terror, Red Bull and I turned and ran for our lives. Our pounding footsteps echoed through the forest, accompanied by the echoing howls of the creature in pursuit. It seemed relentless, its unearthly speed closing in on us. But just as it drew dangerously close, an inexplicable change came over the creature. It abruptly ceased its pursuit, losing interest in our escape. Breathless and trembling, we reached the safety of our tribe's encampment. We dared not speak of what we had witnessed, fearing that our story would be met with disbelief or worse, that it would invite the creature's return. We sought solace in each other's silence, yet the memory of that nightmarish encounter haunted our thoughts. About ten years ago my family and I were doing some fishing four-wheeling in the back country of Colorado. This R is well out of cell phone range and we have been here multiple times before. We usually split up into groups of two, one kid with each parent. We each have a small walkie-talkie to communicate with the other group. My mom and I got out of the jeep and proceed to start fishing in the creek, and not three minutes later we get a bear and bear cub by the river we are coming back to pick you up over the radio which is nothing new. We see bears quite often. So my mom and I hightail it back to the road and hop in the jeep. We drive a few miles up river before we decide to head out again and fish. Well, we have our full day of fishing and start to head out of the area, and on the way out about two or three feet off of the road is an aspen tree stump that had been chain-sawed of at some point. Standing on the stump was the bear cub, just hanging out playing on its own. We don't see mama bear, so we decide to drive by it. Even if we did see her, we would just take off down the road. So I have a disposable camera and we stop for a quick moment to take a few pictures of it. I am literally close enough to touch it. We all stare in amazement because we have never seen a bear cub this close. So naturally we develop the pictures. The pictures have the background, the tree stump, the road, everything in perfect focus but no bear. Everyone in my family saw the bear and we have no idea what happened. We all refer to it as the ghost bear. I write this account with a heavy heart, a tale born from the shadows of a mission that blurred the lines between duty and the haunting specters of war. We were a Navy SEAL sniper team deployed behind enemy lines in Israel, working in tandem with Israeli commandos. Our objective was clear gather intel, disrupt enemy operations, and remain unseen in the unforgiving landscapes of Gaza. Days turned into nights, and nights into endless stretches of silence, as we lay concealed in the shadows, our camouflage blending seamlessly with the harsh terrain. The psychological toll of remaining hidden, observing the ebb and flow of life on the other side, 
was as exhausting as any physical demand our training had prepared us for. My gaze remained fixed through the scope, observing the eons old dance between the cities. The sounds of distant prayers mixed with the occasional bursts of gunfire echoed through the air. It was an eerie symphony, a testament to the perpetual struggle that unfolded beyond our hidden vantage point. One moonlit night, the tranquility shattered. A whisper in the wind carried tales of an enemy sniper, a phantom in Gaza known for his mind games. His reputation preceded him, tales of psychological warfare that left adversaries questioning their own sanity. The silence morphed into a surreal anticipation as we became aware of an unseen adversary playing a deadly game of cat and mouse. Days turned into sleepless nights, with each member of our sniper team taking turns on watch. We felt the unseen eyes of the enemy, a disconcerting presence that transcended the physical realm. Shadows seemed to move independently, and every shift in the wind carried a threat we couldn't quite grasp. Then it happened. A shot, distant yet thunderous, echoed through the silence. The bullet narrowly missed one of our own, a chilling reminder that we were not alone in the darkness. The mind games had begun. As the days passed, the psychological warfare escalated. Whispers in the dark, shapes that danced at the edge of our vision, and the relentless anticipation of an unseen adversary weighed on our minds. The line between friend and foe blurred in the obsidian night. Survival became our only mission. The enemy sniper, elusive as a phantom, kept us on edge, wondering if the next step we took would be our last. It was a game of wits, and we were pawns in a deadly chess match played on the borders of war. In the end, we survived but the scars were etched not just on our bodies, but on our souls. As I looked out over the contested land, I couldn't help but wonder what our encounter with the elusive sniper impact the overall war between Israel and Palestine. Was the psychological trauma we endured a microcosm of the larger, enduring struggle that echoed through the ages? The war continued, a relentless force that swept through the land like an unyielding tide. Our mission was a drop in the vast ocean of conflict, a story whispered in the hidden corners of a war-torn world. As I left the shadows behind, I carried the weight of those days with me, wondering if our encounter with a phantom sniper would ripple through the annals of history, a fleeting moment in the eternal dance between nations. My cousin and I were on our way home from an event one evening and decided to take the lake roads home because it was dusk and we knew the lake would look so pretty and serene. The particular lake we drove around is still decently surrounded by the woods, so there are lots of dense areas. We were driving past this giant field next to the lake that was lined with trees or woods on three sides when she screamed at me to stop the car and back up. Her scream practically made me jump out of my skin, but I agreed and backed up confused. She looked all frantic so I asked her why she made us back up, and she claimed she saw some kind of animal, but it wasn't a normal animal. She said it was standing on its back legs like a bear, and that it was huge and covered in white fur. Whatever it was wasn't there by the time we'd backed up. She's kind of a skeptical person and I'm more of the one who believes in the crazy stuff, so seeing her so freaked out had me thinking she definitely had to have seen something. And I knew there was a legend of the Lake Worth monster in that general area that dates back to, I think, maybe the 60s, so my brain immediately jumped on that. The next time I saw her, we both got on Google so she could see what comes up when you type that in. I'll never forget the way her mouth dropped open. She claimed it looked just like what she saw. This was a few years ago when this happened so I don't know if other people have had any recent experiences or not because I haven't heard anything. But it's something I'll definitely never forget. I was walking through a majestic redwoods forest in California, soaking in the tranquility and beauty of nature. Little did I know that my peaceful hike would take a dramatic turn, plunging me into a heart-pounding encounter that would leave me questioning everything. 
As I strolled along the winding path, the forest embraced me with its towering trees and the gentle rustling of leaves. Suddenly, a noise shattered the serene ambience, jolting me from my reverie. My senses heightened and my heart skipped a beat. Something was approaching, something fast. Before I could react, a massive figure burst into view, sprinting at an incredible speed. It was a Bigfoot. In those fleeting seconds, the enormity of the situation struck me, and fear gripped my every thought. My rifle, resting casually on my shoulder, was now a stark reminder of my vulnerability. It remained there, untouched and useless, as the Bigfoot swiftly disappeared into the depths of the woods. The encounter happened so abruptly and unexpectedly that there was no chance for me to raise my weapon and defend myself. The realization sent shivers down my spine. But what perplexed me even more was the reason behind the Bigfoot's panic. What could have scared such a creature? Its wild sprint through the forest conveyed a sense of urgency, as if it was fleeing from something relentless. The creature seemed completely unbothered by my presence, as if humans were inconsequential in its world. My mind raced with questions. What unknown danger had crossed paths with the Bigfoot? Was there a larger threat lurking in the depths of the forest, unseen and menacing? I couldn't help but feel a mixture of awe, curiosity, and deep unease. My dad, in 1978, was a Portland, Oregon policeman for 30 years. And once a year I went with him while he did his police work for a book report at school or something. I was 12. He worked on the graveyard shift, coming home at four in the morning, about seven miles north of Hubbard, Oregon. We lived down a gravel road about one mile from a school. It was all gravel, but it was long enough for two cars to go past each other, and we were just, you know, half asleep but awake. He and I both saw something leap across the road as if it had already been running. It jumped onto the whole road, which was at least ten feet wide. It didn't even step into the middle. It jumped off the edge of the ditch and right into the orchard next to where we lived. I looked at my dad and he looked at me. He was a very quiet man, but we just said, what was that about? We got to the house and parked the car in the driveway, and we were both running trying to get through the door as fast as we could. When I went to bed that night, I felt like it was morning because I was so anxious. I told my sister that we're moving my bunk beds to the far wall away from the window. Afterward, I didn't talk to anyone except my mom, and I didn't have any close friends and school was out. But then it happened again. A week later, a doctor in his small red Volkswagen drove down the same road towards town. He saw the same thing and was so scared that he stopped at the police station. Of course, that got out, and it was written up in the paper and all that. It looked just like the Patterson one referring to the Bigfoot creature filmed by Roger Patterson, except that it had lighter hair. Back when my mom was in the hospital, I stayed with her for five days. She was on the sixth floor, whereas the food court and snack machines were on the basement floor. I live in a small town so our hospital is the only one with six floors. I rode up and down the elevator so much that I knew this place like the back of my hands. Anyway, one day I went down to get a drink and a Kit Kat. Everything was normal except the Coke machine card reader didn't work. When I got off the elevator on the sixth floor, there were just empty walls. There are no nurses' stations, no rooms, no painting, no furniture, nothing. I walked towards one end to see random size white buildings and the other end to see tall skyscrapers and a shiny metal window type building. I called out over and over but no one replied. I walked to the elevator stop and they were missing. I took out my phone to call the hospital to tell them I was lost, but my phone didn't have any bars this was years ago with flip phones. I kept looking at the windows hoping to find some sort of person to alert but no one was down there. No cars for miles. After realizing I was literally screwed, panic attacks kicked in. 
I sat on the floor, staring at the wall, trying to calm myself down for a half hour. When I woke up, the place looked the same except for the elevators. They were back and I sighed of relief. I got in, pushed to the fifth floor of the maternity ward, and the doors shut. When they opened, there were the basic light-colored walls, borders trimmed with cute duckies, and the sounds of people talking and babies crying. I found the fire escape and figured I'd take my chances on getting to mom's floor. I opened the door and I was back on the sixth floor, the real one. I walked into mom's room and she said that was fast. I told her I must have been gone for over an hour, but she said I had been gone for less than five minutes. I looked at the TV and the bold and the beautiful was still on it's a 30 minute show. I don't know what happened to me or where I was, but I still don't trust elevators. This one time I was swimming in Lake Michigan. It was late at night and I just had a few beers before jumping off my uncle's boat for a swim. I was in the water for maybe five minutes and my uncle and cousin shined the spotlight on me. I will never forget the look of sheer terror on their faces and the yelling that ensued. I felt something slimy wrap around my leg and torso and I started thrashing violently. I managed to get back into the boat and on looking back I saw the biggest, meanest looking bunch of kelp I had ever seen. To this day no one knows what happened to my uncle and cousin. I was asleep one night in December of 2012 at my home in Montgomery, Alabama. I had been experiencing a deep fascination with UFO phenomena, questioning reality, and a deep spiritual awakening. I felt as if I had had similar experiences in my youth to what I'm about to describe, but could never really remember details as I do with this episode. Keep in mind I'm a mother and a professional and do not want to be deemed as crazy. I have only shared this info with my husband right after it happened. I felt as if I was dreaming and I was back in my childhood home several miles from where I actually was. In the dream I woke up and wandered outside as if I was being called to do so. I was then in my former neighbor's front yard. There was a silver disc with three wonderful human-like beings. One felt male and the other two felt female. This was a sort of telepathic feeling. I just sensed who they were and they felt familiar to me almost like meeting long-lost relatives. They emanated an incredible feeling of peace, love and other things that I just cannot put into words. They ushered me into the craft. We ascend straight up. I don't really know what was going on outside the craft, although it did not ascend by any means we know of today. The craft itself was operated by one of the female beings. The craft seemed to know her. The male and other females sat on either side of me. We had a deep conversation about life existence and our purpose here on Earth. We then arrived wherever where. I have no idea where. Again just felt familiar. We exited the craft and we were inside of a building. There were many more beings of the same type. The area was large, very beautiful and bright. There was an enormous sitting area where we continued to discuss very deep subject matter. The other entities were also communicating it was like a council or a meeting. I felt such incredible love that I did not want to leave. Suddenly they told me that I had to come back that I would be okay and they would always be with me. I suddenly woke up in my bed. I dismissed it as a lovely dream. A couple days later while checking my mailbox I noticed a circular pattern in the grass in my front yard. The grass was bent over much like you would see in a crop circle. I asked my husband what it was and he had no idea. Then I realized that the dream I had actually occurred and the craft had landed in my front yard. I told my husband about this and of course he dismissed it. We only talked about it again recently. It came up in conversation and I said what could have caused the indentation and I wished I had taken a picture to which he replied we should have had the soil sampled. He admitted that when I first showed him the first thought he had was UFO and then after telling him the story he was so internally shaken up he couldn't think about it. A 
I was working as a forest ranger up here in Anchorage when this happened. My job at the time was to patrol the remote areas of the park, make sure nobody ever lit fires they weren't supposed to or throw litter when they weren't supposed to. I was equipped with my own radio and rifle with me at all times in case I had to deal with any squatters or crazy people who came in the woods looking to do bad things or maybe camping out at night illegally when they weren't supposed to. It was just before midnight on a Friday evening. I had been patrolling an area called Barney Creek. I hadn't noticed anything unusual happening, so I wasn't expecting anything like that later that night. But then I found a deceased person, a skeleton, more on that in just a second. On my way back to my car is when I saw this body lying across the trail that I'd been walking on. At first I thought it was maybe an animal due to the condition that the body was in. But as I got closer and looked again, I realized it wasn't a bear corpse or any other animal because there was no fur covering its flesh. It had obviously died quite a while ago. After shining my flashlight around the area more thoroughly, with a sense of growing apprehension tapping into whatever bravery might be needed, I slowly approached the remains, took out my camera before beginning to take pictures of the evidence. I was in no way prepared for what I saw when I moved much closer to take a look. The skull was pretty badly rotted and there appeared to be a bullet hole right behind the left eye socket. Some brutal execution must have also happened, maybe even torture, judging by how bony and ripped out their chest area looked without flesh or what was left covering up the rib cage. Whoever they were, somebody wanted them dead and couldn't accept any opposition from whoever they were going after. This meant that whoever killed them was still around and they'd be coming back. They could have been waiting out for me in the forest, possibly planning to take out their sick revenge on me. I had one mission, to get out of there as soon as possible and alert the authorities for backup. I had to run back as fast as I could, which was hard with how freaked out and terrified I was. Still getting lost and occasionally trying to remember every time a branch or leaf would brush against me, I just suspected it was something that could kill me now, kind of like a monster's claw reaching up from behind bushes, ready to grab me by the neck and snap it like a twig. My heart raced with so much fear that I swear it was almost going to pop out of my chest without any warning at all. Finally, after what seemed like forever, I managed then to get away but just collapsed onto the forest floor, completely exhausted. As soon as morning had arrived, I was successful in returning to the area, but the remains were gone. I couldn't tell if somebody had come in and taken them or maybe some animal decided to bury their body under some dirt or leaves until fully decomposed. In any case, it didn't matter much because no one was going to find out who killed that person. But I realized afterwards whoever did it might have been looking for me too. It's best not to say anything about my experience now while I'm still working as a ranger. Look, I don't know what happened, but here in Alaska at night, those skeletal remains still haunt me. I have never seen a cadaver in that bad condition. But all I can say is, why didn't everybody just stay away from this area? Why did this happen? Who's this poor soul that got killed? It definitely looked malicious, like somebody had just left the body there. I mean, that's kind of obvious. Had it been an animal, it would have been eaten or torn apart. But the body had been there for a while, and there were no signs of any animals even touching it. How strange, almost paranormal, if you will. During my ongoing research into the many Bigfoot encounters that have occurred in the Taney County, Missouri area over the years, I posted a request for information on the timeline of a local Facebook group. I was seeking information on Booger Place names and received a message from Darla concerning Booger Knob near Rockaway Beach. I saw something a few years ago, but I couldn't really explain what it was and my ex-husband couldn't either. It definitely wasn't any kind of animal either of us had ever seen, but when we stopped and turned around it was gone. Just took it as something we couldn't explain and never really thought too much about it. It was probably about eight feet tall, kind of dark gray with a little brown. 
had a mane kind of like a male lion, but shorter hair around the body and legs. Was walking upright on its back legs, but once we got close to our car it got on all fours and took off extremely fast. We slowed down, stopped to turn around immediately, and drove back and forth a few times trying to see what it was, but it was completely gone or hiding. Never saw it again. I'm not saying what I saw was Bigfoot, but I know I'm not crazy. My ex and I both saw something neither of us had ever seen before in our lives. I can't explain it. I spend a lot of time in the woods and that was definitely a first. I was working on a pot farm in the Trinity Pines which is like the size of a subdivision and the properties are divided up like that too. So there's one thousands of one two acre pot farms right next to each other. The pines are notorious for people disappearing, large grow operations and crime in general. A friend and I were headed into town to get pizza and supplies for the roughly 20 people we were working on the hill with. It's about a 30-45 minute trip down dirt roads through the holler to a highway that leads into town, but it's only about 12-15 miles away. It was early evening or late afternoon, about 20 minutes into our trip, right before we're off the mountain. This girl comes running out of the trees flagging us down. We stop and let her into car thinking she's another trimmer who just wants a ride into town. I immediately notice she looks frantic so I ask her if she is alright, and she responds in French and very broken English. From what I could gather, she had escaped from a trim job. They had her shackled or handcuffed to a workspace, and she ran for it when they let her off to piss. Apparently she ran straight down the mountain and straight into us. She said the people who took her captive were Nazis and they had guns. We ended up dropping her off at the police station in town. This incident took place when I was in about sixth grade. I'm from Ohio, closer to Kentucky, and we lived in a rural area very far away from people. Our only neighbors were the two houses on the sides of us we lived in the middle house. I was really bored one day and decided to walk through the cow pasture behind my house and into the woods. I began walking and hopped the fence leading into the woods, just exploring for a good hour or so. I didn't stray far, but far enough that I couldn't see my house. As I walked, I got the sense of being watched. That's when I noticed an extremely large buck, bigger than what I'm used to seeing. The antlers were wider than its actual body and seemed sharper than they should have been. It was standing about 20 or so feet away, kind of hidden in the tree line. It was standing at an angle, and it seemed freakishly tall for a deer. The back legs were bent weirdly, and I couldn't see the front hooves. I thought it might be territorial, so I started to back away slowly, not making eye contact. Eventually, I moved out of its line of sight and started heading home. I remember it following me, but still at a distance. There was a noticeable rotting smell, which seemed stronger the closer I got to the deer. As I made my way out of the forest and into the cow pasture, I looked back, and it was standing on the edge of the forest line. It seemed weird, but I shrugged it off. Later that night, around 2-4 a.m., I heard banging outside my window. My window was about 10-ish feet off the ground and faced the back of the house towards the cow pasture. I sat up in my bed, which was pressed up against the window, and peeked out. To my horror, I saw the deer scratching and tapping its antlers against the wall of the house. I tried to shoo it away by making noise, but this caused it to look up and stare at me with its piercing, empty eye sockets. Then it slammed its head harder into the wall before standing up on its back legs and stretching. It began pounding and clawing at the wall, slamming into my window, causing the glass to crack. I let out a blood-curdling scream, which seemed to anger it. My stepdad came running into my room, ready to scream at me, but then he saw the deer trying to climb its way into my window. It was letting out grunts as it clawed at the wall, and its antlers broke through the glass. I fell out of my bed as my stepdad ran to grab his shotgun, firing off rounds into the creature's head. 
As he did this, the creature wailed like a human, almost letting out angry screams before falling back out of the window and crashing to the grass. My stepdad kept firing at it as it continued to wail, before it ran back into the woods in a manner resembling that of a human. Months after this incident, I was living with my grandparents when we received a call that my stepdad had died in an ATV accident that day. What they failed to mention was the fact that the ATV wasn't what killed him. When he initially crashed, he was paralyzed and unable to move, but he was still alive. What happened next was gruesome, he was eaten alive. Half his face, chest muscles, and arm were gone, and they assumed it was wild animals. But the only tracks they found were deer hoof prints. To this day, I don't know what it was. I was told to never talk about it. But now that I live in a city, I wanted answers. So, what do you think? A friend of mine is a diver and told me of a hideous moment he had once while alone in the darkness. He was employed to collect sponges around a reef at night somewhere in Australia. Him and his friend would set off in opposite directions round the reef and meet in the middle. One night he was making his way round when his torch started to stop working. He proceeded to start banging the torch on his hand to try and stir new life into the batteries which was making the torch flicker on and off. Eventually the torch turned on for a brief moment, just long enough for him to see a large shark staring at him from a few feet away. Then the torch switched off again, leaving him in pitch black. I used to hunt in a WMA and had a trail that was the best for any hunting. It was my go-to. Deer, turkey, hog, you name it. One afternoon during deer season, I decide to go further down the trail than I normally do. As I get further down, I start to feel like I'm being followed. I chalk it up to just being alone in the woods and letting my mind play tricks on me. Finally, I find the spot I want to hook my climber to so I make my way through some pretty thick brush and get to the tree. I hook up and climb and get comfortable. About 15 minutes later, I hear whispering. It's so faint I can't make out what is being said. Then I hear footsteps so I get as still as I can be. When I hunt in a climber, I like to combo the F up so I'm covered from head to toe. Then I start to hear the voices getting closer and I can make out what's being said. It's toe guys talking and saying, did you see where he went? And then another voice responds and says, just keep looking and be ready. They finally come into my field of vision, and it's actually a group of six guys. All armed but dressed in regular clothes, clearly not out to hunting. Luckily, they have no idea I'm in a climber and they aren't looking in the trees. They don't say anything else but continue down the trail looking around and pointing their guns like they're ready to shoot the first thing they see. I don't know what their plan was, but I got the F out of there before I could find out, and I started hunting in a different part of that WMA after that. As my wife and I drove through the rain-soaked isolated area, a peculiar sight unfolded before us. It resembled an accident scene, with numerous flashing lights casting an eerie glow. Intrigued by the commotion, I instinctively slowed down, hoping to offer assistance. As we drew nearer, what we initially mistook for an ambulance revealed itself to be an object resembling a large soda can lying on its side, propped up by three peculiar legs. Its creamy color took on an otherworldly appearance, accentuated by a vibrant red halo encircling it. The air buzzed with flashing lights emanating from the enigmatic craft. Caught up in our fascination, my wife suddenly let out a blood-curdling scream, jolting my attention away from the object. I turned around to see two figures approaching our car, their presence unnerving. These beings, best described as bug-like, boasted heads reminiscent of praying mantises. Yet their bodies retained a humanoid form encased in bluish-gray jumpsuits. 
Fear gripped us as the unimaginable came into focus. Driven by terror, I armed with a gun instinctively reached for my weapon and discharged two shots towards the road, hoping to create a deterrent. The sudden commotion seemed to startle the alien figures, compelling them to retreat hastily toward their cylindrical craft, which had landed nearby. Realizing the gravity of the situation, I floored the accelerator, the tires screeching as we raced away from the unfolding scene. As I glanced back in my rearview mirror, my heart sank. Additional humanoid figures resembling the ones we encountered gathered around the craft. Their numbers grew to about nine or ten, standing as silent sentinels, while the object remained motionless. We could only imagine the secrets it held. It was a sight that defied explanation, one that etched an indelible mark of disbelief and fear upon our souls. The craft, however, offered us no answers as it stayed rooted to the spot, concealing its mysteries from our bewildered gazes. We escaped its presence, but the encounter left us forever questioning the nature of the unknown, forever wary of the potential truths lurking beyond our comprehension. As I stood atop the Neolithic mound on that crisp, clear afternoon, accompanied by my husband Philip and our eight-year-old son Edward, I anticipated a moment of tranquility and awe. However, my solitude was abruptly shattered when I spotted a group of people approaching the site from the northwest, traversing the adjacent field. At first, there appeared to be around five individuals, with one smaller figure leading the way and the others forming two pairs. They marched purposefully towards Bella's nap along the field boundary, dressed uniformly in dark, grayish-black attire. Their pale, oval faces peeked out from beneath pointed hoods, their features translucent and ethereal. They drew nearer, only a few hundred yards away, and my disappointment grew. My attention momentarily wavered as my son Edward demanded my attention. When I looked back towards the approaching group, a jolt of surprise coursed through me. More figures had emerged, joining the procession. I urgently informed my husband, emphasizing that there were now hundreds of people coming our way. Impatiently, I urged him to hurry, for at least a dozen of them seemed to be purposefully advancing towards our location. These new arrivals seemed to materialize from the shadowy recesses of the overhanging evergreen trees and bushes nestled between the two nearby fields. Every figure sported a hood, maintaining a steady pace behind the smaller leading figure. From my vantage point, I deduced that the front figure must have been a child, approximately twelve years old, as they stood only half the height of their companions. Curiously, I could not discern any part of their bodies below knee level, as if they were wading through long, pale, dead grass that obscured their lower limbs. They marched in unison, closely hugging the hedge line, never once turning towards their companions. Despite their vigorous stride, they appeared to remain in the same position within the field. Their progress towards the long barrow seemed halted, as if they were traversing a slope, descending into a ditch before ascending on the other side. Growing annoyed by their intrusion, I cast one final glance in their direction before deliberately turning my back and making my way to the opposite end of the mound. Yet, to my disturbance as I reached my destination, they seemed even further away than before, persisting in their resolute advance. I rejoined my son and husband, the latter having completed his photographic endeavors. However, to our surprise, as Philip climbed the mound to take a look, we discovered that the group had vanished without a trace. A sense of unease settled within me, leaving me to ponder the enigmatic encounter. What had transpired on that ancient mound, and where had the hooded figures vanished to? The memory of that day, the inexplicable march of the silent procession, remains etched in my mind forever a reminder of the mysteries that dwell within the folds of time and space. One of my cousin's brothers told me this story. He works in construction and he told me a story about three of his friends that he works with. The three guys are Mexican. Of the three of them, one is an older guy. 
This story takes place east of Flagstaff, Arizona, heading towards Loop. I would say about 20 miles from Flagstaff. There are a lot of cinder cones hills in that area. There's a stretch of H on a igway that goes down a long hill. The three guys were driving from Flagstaff one night. I don't remember where he said they were going, but it was late and the older man was driving. They started down the long hill. When they were halfway down, they witnessed something very crazy and weird. They saw a centaur half man or half horse jump into the center of the road. They said it was very big, at least seven to eight feet tall. It had long hair and it was carrying a wooden club in one hand. They said it had a very mean looking evil face. The sight of it freaked them out and the guy that was driving swerved off the road and they rolled the truck. They crawled out of the vehicle and the older guy that was driving was having a heart attack. They called 911 and soon they were taken to Flagstaff Medical Center. They didn't tell anyone about what they witnessed because they feared nobody would believe them. The older man recovered and they all kept asking each other if they really saw the centaur. They all agreed that they all saw it. They told my cousin about and he said he went to a Navajo medicine man. He asked the medicine man about it. The man told him that it is true. He said that there are seven centaurs that people have seen over the years. The one that they saw with the long hair is the evil one. The mean one. I've heard stories that friends told me when we were kids growing up. I wasn't sure if they were real, but after hearing this, I think they are real. My cousin said the three men are still traumatized by the experience, and they said they will never travel again during the night. Anyway, I wanted to share this story with the group. So this happened to my cousin and not me. He owns a house in the city, and his parents live maybe an hour or so away from him on a nice little chunk of property, few acres not incredibly remote, but it's somewhere where people won't usually be driving at night. So, I guess he was doing some renos on his house and decided to stay with his parents while the work was being done and so one night, he's driving home and when he's pretty close, he notices a car come up super quick behind him. He moves over a bit so they can pass him, but they don't. As he's getting closer to the house, I guess he's starting to freak out a bit so his plan is to just get home and run inside. So he gets to the start of the driveway, kind of a long country driveway, and another car comes from the other direction and tries to block him. Now he knows something is up and when he's close to the house, he starts yelling for my uncle to grab his gun so... He makes it inside and locks the door. This is one of those sort of heavy metal doors with no windows as there's black bears in the area and my uncle comes downstairs half asleep, panicked and ready to shoot whoever is out there. The guys get to the door and start like full on trying to kick it down. My uncle makes some threats. My aunt calls the cops and the guys just kind of leave. No idea what the F was going on. I'm guessing some kind of a robbery, but who knows. Some context, this happened a couple years back. I live in a pre-war building in a big city. It is, I believe, 15 floors high or so. The highest floor is labeled PH on the elevator. I live on the ninth floor. I went in the elevator alone, pressed the button as I always do, and remember it lighting up like usual. The elevator then proceeded to go up, and up, and up, and completely past my floor. The ninth floor button was still lit up though. 10, 11, 12. I am paralyzed in shock and fear I am scared of elevators, and I inwardly imagine if the elevator just kept going and crashed into the roof of the building. It goes up to 14 and then it says PH. The doors open. I am met with the most peculiar scene. I literally have stepped into someone's apartment. I'm in some sort of foyer and I see hooks with some baseball caps. I glance into another room whose door was slightly ajar and see a kitchen and there's a small bathroom in front of me. But none of that is as odd as the piece of paper taped to the door on my left that says police on it with do not cross yellow tape. At that point I noped out of there. 
but couldn't find stairs. So yes, I had to go back down the same elevator. When I got to the lobby of my building, I recounted this bizarre event to my doorman. His eyes widened and he pointed out two things to me. The penthouse is only accessible by key, so you cannot click the PH button in the elevator and go there unless you insert a key and turn it. That's because, as I had already seen, the penthouse elevator opens directly into the apartment. The resident who lived in the penthouse apartment had just recently passed away the previous day. That leaves me to wonder. Why did the elevator take me to the penthouse without the key and without me pressing the button and completely ignore my floor? Could the former resident have been going up to his place or playing a practical joke on me? Or was it merely a coincidence? I guess I'll never know the answer. When I was around eight, nine years old, my grandma had passed away. My mom and I stayed in her fifth wheel where she used to live on her own. And while I was eight, nine, I didn't have my own room, so I would sleep next to my mom. I don't really remember much, but one night I was awakened by my own sweat, I mean burning up in the covers. I opened my eyes and let them adjust, and that's when I saw something on the dresser cut out. It was white and looked like it was leaning down to get a better look at me. I quickly put my head under the blanket and tried shaking my mom awake. She must have been in a deep sleep because it took a few tries. I want to mention that this was in a very, very rural area in Florida. There's no way light could come in through the window as our driveway was blocked by huge trees. It had a round head shape, but the rest I didn't get a good look because, well, I hid. My mom finally woke up shortly after and asked panicked what was wrong and I told her. She's always mentioned I've had a gift, but I have become skeptical as I'm 25 now. However, recently I've been having really odd sleeps where I'm awakened by something same voice every time saying, hello, or what's the time? It's been hard to sleep as well. Ever since I was a child, I've been terrified of the dark and couldn't explain why. But when I close my eyes, I can feel things on me and even hear them. But when I open my eyes, it fades. Does anyone else have this issue? Is it something contacting me or is it just the human body being strange like always? I'm between now. My other story was about a possible apparition moving through someone's kitchen. It got me thinking about when I was a kid 4-7, really young where I would wake up to go use the restroom in the middle of the night. Can't recall the time because I never really looked, but the house was dark, and I slept in my bedroom at the end of the second story hallway. Across the hall was my brother's room, down the hall to the left was an office room area. Directly down the hall was double doors leading to my parents' room, and to the end of the hall at the right was the bathroom and stairs leading down. Now, I would leave my bedroom from the left side of the hall to use the bathroom which would be directly catty corner to my room, and I remember at least twice where there would be a dog-type silhouette. One time it was moving from the bathroom to the office area. The second time it was just sitting at the top of the stairs staring in my direction. I remember this dog was huge, possibly the size of a large German Shepherd. It had pointed ears and a dull red glow in its eyes. I assume it was black, but it was always so dark I'd just see its silhouette. It terrified me, obviously. This could have been my imagination, but I hadn't watched scary movies like Pet Cemetery, or really any scary movies at all because of my age, so I had nothing to compare this figure to or even suggest to myself mentally like a nightmare or hallucination. I had no reference point, basically. Anyway, I did eventually see Pet Cemetery and woke up to an undead corgi beside my bed. But this was after the dark dog-like figure, years later, I believe. Any ideas? The house was only a few years old at the time and was built on farmland. To address any questions ahead of time, Yes, we had a series of dogs growing up. However, at this time, we only had one named Ginger, 
and she was smaller than the figure I'd seen, maybe like 20, 25 pounds in blonde or white. I-22 female have always had problems sleeping going back as far as the age of 7-8. I didn't have the best childhood. Both my parents were drug addicts and split up when I was about 5. My father was abusive towards my mom and would cheat constantly when they were together. Due to that my siblings and I were put in foster homes when I was 6-7. My sister and I were always together in the same homes total of three and my older brothers were also moved from home to home separate from us. Around the time we had all moved back in with my mom my sleeping problems had gotten worse. I couldn't sleep, I would feel like I was being watched and would stay up as much as I could do to some chest pains and constant horrible nightmares. That would subside until high school. During high school I would get sleep paralysis two, four times a night. If I were to take a nap during the day I would also get sleep paralysis. I would just deal with it. Up until I started to see shadows and hear voices during sleep paralysis. One night I had fallen asleep and woke up and saw a figure standing at the corner of the room. It was a lady dressed in all black with a veil over her head. She slowly approached me then got on top of me and started screaming in my face. This terrified me. I had never experienced something like that before. During this time I was also depressed. I didn't see her again or think about it until today. My friend came over and said that he had seen a lady wearing all black in front of me looking at me intensely, and when he turned and looked back she was gone. What does this mean? The last time I had an encounter with her I was very depressed, and although my mental state isn't the best right now, I am just slowly getting out of a depressed episode. I heard somewhere that she appears when you are close to death. How true is this? I patrolled the vast expanse of Yellowstone National Park, a place of breathtaking beauty and tranquility. But lately, an eerie sense of foreboding had settled over the park, leaving everyone on edge. Reports of strange sightings and unsettling events flooded in, spreading like wildfire. Whispers of the Mothman had taken hold, fueled by stories shared on Reddit. As a park ranger named Ray, I prided myself on my rationality and level-headedness. I didn't easily succumb to stories of cryptids and supernatural beings. However, as the days went by and more sightings piled up, even my skepticism began to waver. The Mothman, according to the Reddit threads, was a winged creature associated with impending disasters. Its ominous presence often served as a harbinger of tragic events. I tried to dismiss it as nothing more than folklore, but the growing tension among the park staff hinted at a collective fear. One night, under the watchful gaze of a full moon, I embarked on my usual patrol. The air crackled with an electric energy, and a thick fog enveloped the trees, lending an eerie atmosphere to the park. I glanced around, my senses on high alert. And then I saw it. A silhouette emerged from the darkness, the unmistakable shape of a winged creature. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly intensity. The Mothman, Adrenaline surged through my veins as I fumbled for my camera, desperate to capture evidence of this elusive creature. Before I could steady my trembling hands, the Mothman lunged at me. Its wings flapped with a thunderous roar, and I staggered backward, my heart pounding in my chest. It tackled me to the ground, but before I could react, it swiftly disentangled itself and took flight. Disappointment washed over me as I scrambled to my feet my camera now a useless weight in my hands. I watched as the Mothman disappeared into the night, leaving me with a mixture of awe and frustration. The encounter had been brief, yet it confirmed the existence of this enigmatic cryptid. As the days turned into weeks, the park staff continued to report unusual occurrences. Mysterious accidents, unexplained phenomena, and an overwhelming sense of unease weighed heavily on our minds. The Mothman sightings had become more frequent, intensifying the sense of impending doom. I realized then that my skepticism had been shattered. The Mothman was no mere folklore. It was a part of Yellowstone's dark tapestry. 
I delve deeper into the Reddit threads, searching for answers, desperate to understand the cryptid's purpose and the impending disaster it seemed to foretell. In the end, despite my efforts, the catastrophic event that had been lurking on the horizon arrived. A violent earthquake shook the park, unleashing chaos and destruction. Buildings crumbled, trees splintered, and panic gripped both visitors and staff. As I surveyed the aftermath, I couldn't help but wonder if the Mothman had come to warn us, or if its presence had somehow triggered the calamity. The answers remained elusive, lost in the chaos that had engulfed Yellowstone. It was dead in the middle of winter, and he was working on a camp on a remotish island in the Boundary Waters far north of Minnesota. On this island is a bunch of different cabins, some for sleeping, some for storing things, and one which housed the dining area for the camp. On the one phone on the whole island, my dad received a call from the sheriff from the nearest town. Granted, this town is miles away and across a frozen lake and through miles of forest. The sheriff told him that there was a call for 911 coming from the phone that my dad was talking to him on. He talked to the two other people that were also working up there at the time, both of which were on the opposite side of the island. After checking around to see if there was anyone else there, he went to loom through the other cabins and found nobody. He always tells me that was the only night he slept with a loaded shotgun next to him. I hunt, but I have two stories from the same spot, and I wasn't hunting during either of them. My family was camping in a canyon in southeast Idaho. This location is accessed from northeast Utah. I was about seven at this time, so that would have been around 1981-ish. We were on a family camping trip, and it was about nine at night, and we are all hanging out around the fire. I remember this part because it was so weird. All of a sudden, my dad looks at my mom and in a hushed voice says, Get the kids in the car now. My mom was caught off guard and said, What do you mean? And he said back, Get the kids in the car now as fast as you can. Well, my mom was mad but started telling us to all get in the car, so we all did. After we were all in the car, my dad hoped in the driver's seat and we backed out of the campground and drove one hour and ten minutes home. Leaving everything we brought at the campsite, including the fire burning, I know this is bad, but this was the ADS and I'm sure none of us had our seat belts on either. The next morning my dad and uncle went back up and loaded all of our stuff up and brought it home. Okay, so no flash forward to about 2003, and I'm talking to my older brother about this camping trip. And I asked him why did we leave that night. Well, come to find out we were being watched by. Well, something. So as my dad was sitting there and he was looking at a line of bushes about 20 yards away, he watched a head walking back and forth behind these bushes. Here is the kicker. The bushes were about six to seven feet tall. I guess my dad watched the thing for about 30 to 60 seconds before it turned its head and looked at us, and he could see the two eyes reflecting back at him because of the firelight. It scared him so bad he made us all go home that second. My brother said he never did say what he thought it was, he just knew it was large and tall. 2. Same spot as camping trip from 1. It's about 1995 and me, my friend and younger brother are camping in this same spot because we were going to go fishing the next day. Remember I did not know about why we left this spot until years after this. It was about 2 a.m. and we were all sleeping when down from the canyon to the east of us came the low scream. It wasn't like a woman's scream, it was low like a man yelling, but that's not even a good description. And the reason I know it came from the east was we woke up to it, and as I was saying what was that, it screamed again. We did not sleep much that night, and we all put our handguns in our sleeping bags with us. Edit. Also that gut feeling people described above is something I have had many times there. I don't think I have been back there since I found out why my dad left. Not from being scared, but more of I don't live by there anymore. Something pretty crazy happened to my best friend and I about six years ago. It was the summer after we graduated high school, so we were in that transition phase between high school and college. 
No responsibilities. No worries. We played a shit ton of video games during the day, took spur-of-the-moment road trips to a bunch of places, and often stayed up all hours of the night. Late one particular night, we were driving around in my friend's dad's old Volvo, and we stumbled upon the entrance to a nearby canyon we had never heard of or been to. By this time, it was about three in the morning, but we were curious, so we start heading up the road. We were in high spirits, music loud cracking jokes and weird accents. The usual. But down the road we see this sign. It was one of those cement road barriers. There was a number of them parallel to the road, but this one was placed perpendicular, and it said, No camping in X Canyon, in red spray paint. My friend and I looked at each other. We thought that was a little weird. With most of the nearby canyons, whichever government entity that maintains them has official metal or wood signs erected. But it wasn't anything too out of the ordinary, so we shrugged it off and kept going. At the base of the canyon, it was mostly meadows with low bushes, but further in, it became much more wooded. The scrub oak had grown tall over the road, creating a sort of tunnel. It was beginning to feel a little eerie and claustrophobic, but we weren't the skittish type. We both acknowledged the creep factor of the canyon and kept driving. Then another sign. This time it's plywood nailed to a tree said the same thing. No camping. Red spray paint. Again, we're thinking, what the hell is with this place? So now we're both fairly sketched out, but we didn't really know why. Yes, the makeshift signs were odd, but maybe whoever maintained the canyon just hadn't gotten the official signs put up yet. Yes, the forest had a spooky vibe, but don't all forests feel like that at night? So again, we kept going. But the further in we went, the less we talked, until we both didn't really say anything. Then it happened. Up ahead, through the scraggly tree branches, we see this light. A campfire. We slow down. My friend asks me what time it is, so I check my watch. 3.45 am. You know that, oh shit. Feeling of deep, intense dread? Instantaneously, we both have it. I say we need to turn around, but the canyon road is too narrow. So my friend just starts saying shit over and over as he drives forward. Looking back, I'm not sure why we didn't just floor it driving past the fire, but I think despite the fear, we both had to know what was going on. So we drive up pretty slow, going maybe 10-15 miles per hour. The first thing that came into view was a bunch of cars parked in this clearing, just at the edge of the firelight. Then in the middle of the clearing we see the campfire and a group of seven, eight figures standing around it in a loose circle. They weren't wearing anything strange. They didn't seem to have any weapons. There didn't seem to be anything other than wood burning in the fire. But there were no tents, no camping chairs, and every single one of them were frozen in place, staring at us as we passed. The second we get beyond view, my friend and I lost our marbles. I screamed at him to floor it, so he hit the gas until we came to a turnout just a little down the road where my buddy made a miraculous U-turn. However, I do vaguely remember almost careening off a cliff. At any rate, we came flying back down the road, and again we see the fire coming up quick. Keep in mind, it's only been a minute, maybe a minute and a half, since we first drove past. The clearing came into view and I shit you not, everyone is gone. The cars are still there. The fire is still there, but every single one of the figures is just straight up gone. We didn't call the police or even really talk about it much after that until several weeks later, we decided to go back in the daytime just to see what was there. But when we got to the bottom of the canyon, those same cement barriers were now placed across the road, blocking the entrance. The one with red spray paint was conspicuously missing. Posted on one of the barriers was a metal sign that read X Canyon closed due to ongoing police investigation. It was a crisp morning in June 1980 when my friend and I decided to embark on an adventure to visit our friend's newly constructed lean-to on Snow King Mountain near Jackson, Wyoming. Little did we know that this journey would take an unexpected turn forever etching an encounter with the unknown in our memories. As we made our way up the mountain, excitement filled the air. We relished the opportunity to explore the wilderness and soak in the beauty of nature. 
However, our enthusiasm quickly turned to trepidation as we stumbled upon something that defied all logic and reason. There, amidst the towering trees and rugged terrain, we came face to face with a sight that would forever haunt us. A hairy, man-like creature stood before us, its massive frame reaching a staggering twelve feet in height. Long, dark hair cascaded down its hunchbacked form, with arms extending almost to the ground. Fear gripped us as we stared into the creature's simian-like face, which seemed as large as a stop sign. Its heavy breaths filled the air, accompanied by a haunting moaning growl that sent shivers down our spines. We knew we had encountered something truly extraordinary, something that defied our understanding of the natural world. Instinctively, we turned and ran, desperate to escape the presence of this mysterious creature. To our dismay, it pursued us relentlessly, never relenting in its pursuit. We could hear the creature's eerie sounds reverberating through the trees as we sprinted, hearts pounding in our chests. The chase seemed never-ending, our adrenaline-fueled sprint blurring the boundaries between reality and the surreal. It was as if we had stumbled into a realm of myth and legend where the lines between human and beast were blurred. Finally, as our strength waned, we reached a streetlight near the Ramada Snow King Inn in Jackson. Gasping for breath, we dared to glance back, hoping to catch a glimpse of the creature that had pursued us so relentlessly. And there it stood, under the flickering light, a specter in the night, before it vanished into the depths of the surrounding darkness. We staggered back, our minds reeling with disbelief at the surreal encounter we had just experienced. Rushing to the local police, we shared our tale, knowing deep down that few would believe the magnitude of our encounter. The memory of that day still lingers, etched into the fabric of our beings. We were forever changed, forever aware that there are realms beyond our comprehension, where creatures lurk in the shadows, challenging our notions of what is possible. Though the world may scoff at our story, dismissing it as mere imagination or trickery, we know the truth. We crossed paths with the unknown with a creature that defied explanation, leaving us with a profound sense of awe and an everlasting curiosity about the mysteries that lie hidden in the depths of our world. I was driving from Las Vegas to Lake Havasu City in my truck and it was around 1 a.m. The roads were mostly empty and the dark night stretched out ahead of me. After passing through searchlight, I found myself on a stretch of two-lane road, with bushes lining each side, seemingly reaching out towards the asphalt. As I cruised along, the monotony of the road started to take its toll on my senses. The rhythmic hum of the engine provided a comforting backdrop to the quiet desert night. But then, out of nowhere, a peculiar sight caught my attention. There, just before I passed, a large bush bent towards the road at an angle of about 60 degrees. It appeared as if something had forcefully knocked it over, causing it to lean precariously. Confusion and curiosity mingled in my mind. None of the other bushes seemed to be affected by the wind or any other external factors. It was an isolated incident, standing out like a mysterious anomaly in the stillness of the night. I couldn't shake the eerie feeling that something out of the ordinary had just occurred. Uncertainty filled the air as I continued my journey, my foot pressing the accelerator, propelling me forward at a speed of 90 to 100 miles per hour. The road stretched out before me, seemingly endless, and I couldn't help but steal glances in the rearview mirror half expecting the bush to have righted itself or to witness some other strange occurrence. Eventually, the two-lane road led me to the freeway, where the atmosphere shifted. The sense of isolation gave way to the presence of other vehicles, their headlights piercing through the darkness. I merged onto the freeway, leaving the enigmatic encounter behind me. As I continued my drive, my mind raced with possibilities, trying to make sense of what I had witnessed. Was it a trick of the light? an odd gust of wind, or something entirely inexplicable. The image of that bent bush lingered in my thoughts like a puzzle piece that refused to fit. My cousin recently moved here from Secunderabad, India. On a recent road trip exploring America, we were shooting shit, exchanging ghost stories, and laughing at sea and differences between American and Indian ghost stories when I asked her if she's ever experienced anything supernatural. 
Her eyes widened as she averted her eyes to the window. When the silence was about to be too much for me, she softly responded, Yes, a few. One is troubling. In my second year in college, I stayed in an all-girl hostel dorm. I made many friends. We were all delighted to be away from our conservative parents in school. The hostel was so much fun, but it was an ancient building. Electricity was only put in the rooms. Sometimes candles were placed along the windows if a watchman was present. But generally, you were faced with complete darkness once you left the chambers. It's common to wake someone if you need to walk down to the restroom at the end of the hall. We all had a childish fear of being alone in the dark. One night, I had to use the restroom. It was about 4 a.m. I went to my friend's bed and tapped her on the arm. She immediately opened her eyes as soon as I touched her. I apologized for bothering her and told her I needed to pee. She smiled at me and hopped out of bed. Down the hallway, she laughed and danced. I could not see her, but her bangles clanked together loudly and the bells on her anklets jingled softly. It was very calming. I laughed and sashayed my hips down the hallway with her, too tired to match elaborate arm movements. She said nothing to me, though occasionally I heard her hum one of our favorite Bollywood songs. The same thing happened on our return. Fell back asleep quickly. One awoke pretty late the following day to the sound of men in our room. They surrounded her bed. I bolted from my bed, prepared to protect my friend, when I realized they were college administrators. I peered over closer. My friend's lifeless eyes were fixated on my bed, the same smile on her fac. Her time of death was 11.30 p.m., almost five hours before I woke her. It was late night in late October, early November of 1975, I was a 10-year-old child. At that time, I was going through a late bed wedding phase and remember I was determined to end that embarrassment. I awoke for the second or third night in time to relieve myself and remember being happy and proud that I caught it in time again. As my eyes creaked open slightly, I saw movement in the room and at least what I thought were African-American kids in my room moving around. I remember thinking that the only thing they could steal of any value was my prized small black and white TV that was on my dresser next to my bed. As you can imagine at this time my heart was pounding through my chest and just wanted them to take the TV and leave. I creaked my eyes open ever so slightly as not to be noticed and was shocked to realize that they weren't afros which were common at that time but were whole heads. I can't really express my thoughts of that instant realization when I saw who was really in the room at that time other than how in a nanosecond I went from there's no such things as aliens to oh my god they're real to what do they want. At that time there was no such things as greys or anything similar to what has been so defined into pop culture today. Being late October early November there was a harvest moon and I had a fairly large picture window in my room which lead to some fair amount of ambient room lighting which I shared with my five-year-old brother who slept in an adjacent bed next to mine. During this event I was creaking my eyes open enough as not to be noticed, laying on my back when I woke up and my bed covers were at my waist. All I wanted was to get my bed cover up to my head so I was ever so slowly and methodically creeping them up during this entire event, as not to be noticed. There was a larger one that stood against the wall directly across from the foot of my bed that just stared at me. There was another knelt down on the opposite side of my brother's bed and what I thought at the time was that he was doing something to his arm. I my head at the time my mind was reeling, my parents' room was directly behind me, and if I screamed my father would come running in. I remember thinking that the one next to my brother I was taller than and equated him to being in my grade remember I was 10. So if he came over to me my big plan was to jump up and dive on him and scream for my dad. The one against the wall just standing there I remember as being a grade or two older than me and he would probably do something before my dad to get in. I remember thinking I could end the whole debate that are we alone in the universe and the weight of that thought being succumbed to he's killing my brother and not being able to muster the internal strength to do something. My next thought was that if he comes over to me he can't put a needle in me so I started to tear up and that diffused my sight to what was happening in the room. 
Then the one that was knelt next to my brother got up and came at me, pure horror as my eyes were teared, and he rounded my brother's bed and in one motion knelt down on his right knee, and in one motion opened his toolkit and kind of flipped and twisted his left wrist and reached in. At that very moment I couldn't hold it anymore and thought needle, and I made an audible pre-cry wail. The face that the creature made still haunts me today. Honesty. It's the same face people make when they make a surprise mistake a eek I did something embarrassing facial expression. His mouth was just a slit so when he made that expression his face rippled and wrinkled like a old man. Immediately whatever he was taking out of his box which was a really weird shape, then but not now it was hexagonal with a diagonal opening and handle put it back and got up and they marched out. Again another part of this is memory that has crept me out is how they moved like the military and moved or better said marched out of my room. I was shocked and with unreal timing as I looked down the hallway when they passed my parents room two more came out and filed in line with such precision and marched down the hall and all turned down the stairs out of my sight. Again I must stress the timing was if they were one. Needless to say I didn't sleep the rest of the night. My younger brother was fine in the morning, and no one in my family knew anything of the night's event. I lived near a large metropolitan area at the time and our house was the only house surrounded by 260 acres of woods. I only told a handful of people since then and find it very difficult and seriously doubt many of these accounts I read of abductions myself. Ironic, isn't it? They were very, very real and I wish I dreamed it, but I didn't. My impression then and my life of the events of that night is that these beings are cold and indifferent to us. Basically, they are not our enemies, but most certainly aren't our friends. There might be a very good reason our government has kept this secret for so long. Being that I live on the coast of them's hate all you want. But just know that south of I-10 is nothing like the typical stereotype which that in itself is far off as well, I have been on and around the water my entire life. I have many stories of crazy things and experiences happening, while being on the water such as dealing with bad weather lightning storms, water spouts, high seas, etc. Which can be awesomely frightening, but the craziest things I have seen have happened while running working on fishing charter boats. The one that always sticks with me and I would also say the most eye-opening occurred back in 2010 when the Deepwater Horizon oil rig blew and began spewing oil into the Gulf of Mexico. BP, after realizing to a certain extent how vast the spill was, began a program that allowed owners of boats to register and participate in the cleanup of the coastline. Side note. Those that were lucky enough to be accepted into the program sometimes took advantage of an awesome opportunity to do something good for the environment and made some serious money from it, while at the same time preventing others from getting into the program who would have actually helped that somewhat mentioned later, but overall is a story for another discussion. So being that the water that I had basically grown up on was being destroyed, I couldn't just sit back and not do anything. I went and got hazmat certified for this particular instance among other certifications and through certain contacts I first started working on a 127 feet charter boat. This boat normally will go out to the Chandelier Islands located off the coast of Louisiana for several days nights and drop skiffs in the water where clients were guided around the islands to fish also I would suggest if anyone has the opportunity to go out to these islands do it. It's incredible there and the fishing is always on point back to story. I was working on this boat for about two weeks and then was transferred to an offshore division that consisted of about 10-15 boats. These boats by the way were strictly personal fishing and commercial charter boats with the largest being 57 feet and an average price of around $100,000 and a couple worth well over a 1 million conservatively. Our job was to leave at 6 a.m. and go out and look for oil or any marine life etc. that may have been impacted by the spill. If we found oil crude, oil slicks, or anything else out of place or not normal we'd log it, take pictures, and report it. For about a month we were only finding slicks. One day we went out about 120 miles and I'll never forget the sights or smells that day. The crude we called it mud because that is exactly what it looked like was everywhere and ridiculously thick on average 6 in and in some places up to 1 ft. 
it was like a super thick putty and to be honest is actually really hard to describe. To put this into perspective though, if you have ever been mud riding or seen a truck get stuck in mud, that's exactly what it was like to these boats, but out on the water and a lot worse. This over time destroyed the boat's hulls among other things causing significant damage. We were the first group to find the crude and report it coming in that close to shore. Also during this time we found a life jacket belonging to one of the guys who actually worked on the oil rig. Words honestly cannot describe what that was like. It was a very surreal moment to say the least. So we eventually get back to shore, and that's when things start to change. The operation had now shifted to, how the hell are we going to clean this up? And, what the hell are we going to do with it? It wasn't until this point when we all realized how serious this was, not only for the coastline but for the environment as a whole. The next morning at the dock we noticed that pallets of skimmers and absorbent boom had been dropped off. We were to use the skimmers to round up as much crude as we could, tie off the skimmers into a circle, and place the boom together with the crude inside. That would then be brought to decon stations by another division who was assigned that job these were the shrimp boats. Reminder, our job originally was to just spot, find, take pictures, and report. Not necessarily handle the oil if all possible. To sum up how that operation went, it was complete shit and that's being nice. It got to the point where instead of myself being the only one who could technically handle the crude on my boat, everyone else working the boats eventually ended up in tight suits handling this foreign ass toxic substance in 100 plus degree temperatures for 12 plus hours a day. Side note. Each boat had to have at least one hazmat certified person on board at all times who was supposed to be the only person handling the crude. Also only four people were allowed to work on each boat in our division. We also ended up getting stranded twice by the shrimpers who decided to call it day at lunchtime leaving us with no way to move the crude while also not allowing us to leave because we couldn't just leave the rounded up crude unattended. Yay. Absolutely miserable. Nobody could ever have imagined what we were getting into, and along with that, BP themselves had no idea what they were getting into and their claims of being prepared, and we're on top of this with all available resources. Blah blah blah. Was completely overshadowed by the fact that they truly did not know how to run and contain an operation of this size and magnitude, and that was seen day in and day out. This became a day-to-day -day challenge up until the point when my shady-ass boss got caught being greedy charging BP for every miscellaneous thing he bought which caused all his boats to be shut down. His first check was said to be upwards of $450,000 and that's rounding it off. During this time both the employers, the boat owners especially and employees were making some serious money. What ruined it were the greedy bastards who just couldn't get enough. This is turn caused less boats that were actually doing it for the right reasons from being able to make a change out on the water. In total we worked a little over three months. Going out every day and seeing schools of dead fish, dead sea turtles, and the water that you grew up on literally turned into a mud pit, as that's exactly what it was, was disheartening to say the least. Though all that happened and we dealt with so much, there was one time where we saw that what we were doing might have been helping just a little bit. On one of our last trips, we were about 20 or so miles out past the barrier islands when we could see from a distance what looked like the water boiling and had a red, orange, and yellow color to it. When we got close, we realized it was a school of thousands of redfish and jack creville that stretched as far as we could see and was about 100 or so yards wide. Being in the middle of that surrounded by these fish just cannot be described with words. It was incredible, and that was the one moment that gave us hope that what we were doing was not a waste, and that we were in fact doing something worthwhile. Still to this day, it is the most incredible thing I have seen on the water aside from the oil spill itself. Lastly, just to throw this out there, there is still tons of oil out in the gulf regardless of what people say. It's just buried and on the sea floor due to the so-called dispersants that BP claimed would break the oil up. It still can be found on the islands, beaches, and marshes. The marine life is just now getting back to normal again in the past two years, and it's only going to get better as long as some shit like this don't happen again. There is so much more that I could talk about from this time. 
ranging from the oil itself to the things BP supposedly did and did not do. That's all for another day though. Again, sorry for the long post, but this one experience is always the one I come back to when asked about things I have seen on the water, and with this thread I felt it should be mentioned. Hunter slash mountaineer here. It was a chilly December morning. I hiked in pre-dawn, taking about an hour and a half to go three miles off the beaten trails. Got to my nest about half an hour before sunrise and started to settle in. The wind kicked up and a fog rolled in that was thicker than milk. Within a few minutes, my visibility was five. I'm sitting tight, huddled up against the freezing wind when I start to hear twigs snapping close to me. For no apparent reason, what is normally a rapturous sound indicative of an imminently successful hunt sent a frosty chill down my spine. I chambered around in my lever action 30-30 as quietly as I could and lay flat on my back tucked against a fallen tree. The rustling was moving closer through the fog, but I couldn't see anything. The sun was starting to peek over the mountains to my east and visibility was starting to increase. The rustling of twigs and leaves was sporadic, sometimes directly in front of me, sometimes behind or beside me. I remember laying there, rifle across my chest, thinking to myself how silly it was to react like such a coward. I rationed with myself that bears and mountain lions are a rarity where I was, and I had likely stumbled into a herd of white tail that had bedded down. I decided to sit up. The rustling stopped immediately. As it was fully dawn by now, I was looking through the fog for the outline of my prey, which I had assured myself was literally all around me. It wasn't. Seemingly, nothing was. By now, the fog had faded away, and it was apparent to me that I was alone in those woods. I hunted all that day without seeing so much as a squirrel. Around three in the afternoon, after fighting the wind and an abnormally cold day, and not wanting to hike out by flashlight, I decided it was time to start back to the truck. Walking out of those woods was the most uneasy I have ever felt. Lawfully, once you make it back to the trail, you're supposed to clear the chamber of your rifle. Not that day. What is normally a stroll through the woods, I undertook with the seriousness of an animal being stalked. I would walk, then stop and listen. I never heard or saw anything during my retreat, but I could feel eyes on me. I was about 100 feet away from my truck when I rounded the last corner and saw, hanging at eye level from a tree by a noose, a stuffed bear in a blaze orange jacket. I'm a giant, broad-shouldered outdoorsman, but that one shook me something fierce. Well, I'm a trucker and a lot of my routes take me through Indian reservations. I won't sleep on a reservation unless it's a truck stop anymore because of this. Short story, but I was about 30 miles east of Tuba City and was shut down for the night as some pot on gas station in the middle of nowhere. I had just started to get into my book when all of a sudden I hear what sounds like people hitting the outside of my truck with open hands everywhere. It's on my roof 13 foot 5 inches about my walls, the back of the sleeper, sides of my sleeper. I grabbed my Bowie knife and bolted out my door ready to scare some kids. There was nothing. The ground was dirt and a little wet, but when I looked at the ground there were no footprints. My truck was dusty, but there were no handprints. That was one of the scariest things that's happened to me on the road. So like I said, if I'm on a res, unless there's a truck stop, I will not shut down. I was patrolling my usual forest trails at night. I've been a ranger for eight years now, and nothing had ever scared me as much as this one experience that I encountered. Well, what I think was a Bigfoot. Doing my routine patrol on this night, it all started with me walking along the same trail I do at night to do my rounds. Being Florida, it had rained earlier in the day, so everything was calm and peaceful, minus the puddles of mud here and there. The sun had set about an hour or two before, which meant it was exceptionally dark outside, although I was already used to this. The moon was barely out. I saw a few other rangers patrolling with me, but they had passed by. And somewhere out of nowhere, 
Maybe about 30 minutes later, I was walking along the dirt trail when I noticed something appeared in front of me. A dark, large figure coming from the right side of the path and then crossing in front of me as it headed off into some thick brush off to my left palmettos. Actually, this is directly where I patrol, meaning there should most definitely not be anything even remotely close to resembling whatever this thing was. Its speed is what surprised me and took me off guard, considering it didn't even give me enough time to turn around and see what it looked like. All I could make out was that it was jet black, very tall and easily taller than I was. It moved quickly. I didn't even have time to react until laughter had already gone into the bushes, disappearing as quickly as it had appeared, deep in the palmettos. My heart sunk and I felt an odd sensation. It was this incredible feeling of fear. All I could think about is how much more dangerous it had just made my job that night. If there was some large animal out here that moved fast, was taller than I, and larger than I, that actually crossed paths with me like it did, what else might be lurking on here? Would it cross paths with me again? Was this thing actually looking for me? As I thought about it more, I considered the fact that if something was after me, then maybe whatever it was might be prepared to attack. Although I wasn't going to back down without a fight, I began getting angry. Maybe it was my mind playing tricks on me, but I was a few hours away from my shift ending and talking myself into returning to the station, telling myself that if I did, I would be safe. If this thing is out there, it's just as much looking for me as it is anybody else. So now, more than ever, Getting to my ranger station was my only priority. I didn't really know what it was or what to think about it, but there was only one way to find out, and that was by continuing my patrol. Now, I stood still for a moment, debating with myself on whether or not I should continue, remembering all the times going back home early had made me feel like a failure. Although I had never encountered anything like this before, it didn't mean there's nothing out there. It only means that whatever it was hadn't bothered me yet. But now that it had crossed paths with me, I might be next on this list of things to kill. That would have made me sick. The rest of my story is pretty uneventful, unfortunately. After this, not a lot happened. I didn't see the figure again. And as I look back on this event and reflect, I believe I encountered a skunk ape, a Bigfoot native to the Florida Everglades. While it was probably harmless and didn't want to actually hurt or kill me, it was still completely terrifying. I still don't know if this creature was real or not, but that didn't matter. Regardless of what it actually is, I'm convinced that whatever it was, it wanted to hurt me. Or so I had convinced myself and still wonder. So my husband and I were watching a scary movie. We don't usually watch scary movies, but we thought it would be fun since our kid was staying with his grandparents for the night. About halfway through the movie, we got bored of it and decided to call it a night. It was around 11.30 p.m. We were watching it in our bed, so we just turned off the TV and lights and laid down. Within maybe 30 seconds of turning off the movie, I hear a man talking. It sounded like it was coming from our basement. We live in a log home, and we sleep in the loft, which is open to the rest of the house. The stairs leading up to our room are made of half logs, so you can peer through them and see down into the stairs leading directly below into the basement, which also has no door. At first, I thought maybe I was imagining it. I have auditory hallucinations before I fall asleep all the time, so I thought that's what it was. We have a German shepherd who sleeps at the top of the stairs in the loft with us, and she hadn't seemed to notice anything. About ten seconds after hearing the voice, I hear several other sounds. Sounds of something moving in the basement. Jostling and gentle thuds. At this point, my husband whispers, Did you hear that? And I'm like, Yes. And he says, It sounded like a man talking. And I'm like, OMG, yes. So he jumps out of bed, puts on his robe, gets the gun, and starts checking around the house. I have my phone up ready to dial 911 if need be. He starts in the basement, nothing. 
All the windows are closed and locked, and the alarms on them are undisturbed. Same with the sliding door. We check the rest of the house and still nothing. I'm super freaked out at this point. He has to get up early for work, so we go back upstairs to our bed. He goes to sleep, but I'm too freaked out, and I stay up with the lamp on ready to attack the sneaky intruder until around 2 a.m. when I was too tired to stay up any longer. I heard a couple more strange noises up until I fell asleep. Most of them I attributed to the house shifting. My box fan made a high-pitched squealing noise a few times, which I've never noticed before. Almost sounded like bats squeaking. I just cannot relax about the situation because I can't come up with a solution as to why this happened. The house was secured. There's no way anyone could be inside. We live in a rural area and know our neighbors. They don't wander around our property. It just doesn't make sense. The voice didn't sound particularly threatening. It sounded like a country boy talking to his buddy. Not super loud, not quiet, just a casual interaction. Edit. I previously selected the wrong tag for this post. My bad guys. I don't believe in ghosts. If I see someone I don't know and trust like on TV, for example, telling a ghost story, I struggle to believe them. That being said, I had an experience when I was around 10 years old that I'm going to share today. This was in approximately 2003. My friend and I were walking to football training. I live in a quiet countryside town in Scotland. To get to the football training, we would walk past the tennis courts as it saved a lot of time. The tennis courts are located at the bottom of a wide open grassy area. Next to the tennis courts is a sloped section of ground that runs the length of the court. I think it's meant to be the stand where people can sit or stand and watch. It's sort of like a grassy pyramid that's been stretched out in length. There is a path that leads down to the stand and just stops. On the far side of the stand is a small wooded area. We were on the path walking toward the tennis courts. It was broad daylight. No one is around. The wooded area briefly falls out of view as the path is on a slight decline. We walk up the hill of the stand onto the main body of it, and there is a woman standing at the trees. She is stood with her hands clasped in front of her, looking directly at us. My friend and I are walking toward her. She is stood between a fence and a small stream that's guarded by a waist-height fence. We walk the length of the court, now less than ten meters from her. She hasn't moved. She's just continued to stand and stare. We turn at the bottom of the court now with our back to her. We haven't said a word, but we looked at each other and ran. The woman was grey in appearance, but wasn't transparent or anything. She looked like a real person, but she was a sort of uniform colour. Washed out looking. Clothes included. It's quite hard to describe. She didn't move once. And I don't mean she just stood still. She didn't move at all. She was three-dimensional, but it was like she was a cutout that had been placed there. My first thought wasn't, oh my god, it's a ghost, only afterward did we realize what might have just happened. There is nowhere this woman could have came from. There are two meter fences blocking everywhere apart from the far side entrance to the tennis court and the approach we used to get there. The far side entrance line of sight is never broken. The stand only obscures a part of the wooded section for a moment. She simply was not there. We broke line of sight for five, ten seconds and there she was. The village I live in is small. I had never seen this person before, and I haven't seen her since. For a good ten years, that area would terrify me at night. I would hug the fence until I had to turn my back to the area. We saw her at which point I would run. Doesn't matter how muddy the grass was, it was genuinely too frightening to care about the condition of my shoes. I don't know how to explain this. I tell people I don't believe in ghosts if they ask, but I always offer this story as a consolation. Looking back on it, I wish I spent more time looking at her. As it was happening despite not realizing what I was potentially looking at, the unbroken eye contact was unsettling. It made it difficult to look at her. 
That friend and I don't speak anymore. We haven't for around 15 years. But I bumped into him in the town about four years ago. The first question I asked him once the greetings were over and done with was, Remember we saw that ghost? He said, I do mate, I... So a few years later, my cousin and I went out to check deer feeders or stands. As we were crossing a field to get to a deer stand that was set up on poles eight, ten foot off the ground, we noticed what we presumed to be a head peering over the top of the wall watching us. We were a good 100 yards off, but it was obvious that something was in the stand. My cousin wanted to go check it out, but I got spooked. I don't know if it was that uneasy feeling of predation or my past encounter with vagrants at our lease. But I talked him out of confronting whatever was up there. We hustled back and told our dads what we had seen. We went back to the stand, but didn't see anything watching us this time, so we crossed the field, climbed the pipe ladder to the landing, and found open cans of soup, some dirty clothes, and a mutilated fawn. Whoever had been squatting in our deer stand had killed, and was eating a young deer without benefit of cooking as far as we could tell. There was blood everywhere. Could this be Sasquatch? We never did run into whoever was surviving out there. Fortunate for him, because I was ready to shoot anything that moved after that. That's the last of my experiences. As you can imagine, I didn't enjoy going to deer leases as a kid. I was on my golf cart by myself, and it was completely dark outside and quiet. I live in a neighborhood surrounded by farmland and woods throughout various spots. I was driving but pulled over because this giant beetle was on my shirt. It pinched me and freaked me out. I pulled over next to a stretch of woods and struggled to get it off of me. In the woods nearby I heard walking, like perhaps a deer walking around, so I wasn't scared. Yet the sounds got louder and closer. The walking had gotten so loud it sounded unreal, something out of Jurassic Park like a dinosaur stomping. The walking had gotten overwhelmingly loud and extremely close, so I slammed on the gas and get the F out. I looked behind me but couldn't see anything, but felt shivers down my spine because I swear it was inches behind me. Not sure if this has anything to do with it, but I was talking about skinwalkers with my sister and doing some research, so I hope that didn't invite anything. But I can't even describe how loud the stomping was. It sounded unreal and was seriously terrifying. My partner and I first heard these stories from a co-worker who overheard another officer talking about it. We thought and were convinced they were making the whole thing up. But one night, me and my partner decided to drive around the park to see if we can find anything weird for ourselves. We head down this lone dirt road tall grass on either side, and suddenly three deer burst out in the dark to our right. Our headlights caught them moving just as they ran into the trees on the left. So naturally, we could tell they were being chased by something. We turned off the headlights and began moving very slowly, keeping an eye out for anything big. We drove slowly, more and more down the winding road until finally, something came into view in front of us. It looked like a large, hairy man crouched over, and as soon as it came out, you could just see its silhouette against the cold night sky. And since it was so dark, I couldn't see much, but the thing kind of turned around and began moving in our direction, and then moved away. As soon as my partner and I saw it, we got this really weird feeling, like something terrible was about to happen. So we quickly turned our headlights on. By that point, it was already gone. We pulled out of there, left pretty quickly. I don't even want to acknowledge what that could have been. I don't think I'm ready to accept that reality just yet. My uncle usually hosts winter parties at his house every year. One year, his basement was flooded, so we had no choice but to hold the party somewhere else. It was held at a nearby lodge, on the side of the lodge was a road, 
and across the road was a small section of trees with a pond in it. An hour or two before the party ended, my cousin and I were outside near that road. We heard a noise coming from the trees, which sounded like something stomping in the pond. Note that when I say stomping, I really do mean stomping. Not just some animal swimming around in there. Like something was deliberately and forcefully doing God knows what in that pond. My cousin and I went inside and told our other cousin, and the three of us went back out. Being teenagers and all, we decide, hey, let's throw rocks. So that's essentially what we do. A few rocks in, another rock lands in front of us. Whatever was in there threw a rock back. We all went back in and told our other cousin, our older and more smart cousin, who decided, hey, let's go over there. We start heading over to the trees, and pretty much as soon as the older cousin sets foot on the grass, the stomping gets faster and louder, as if whatever it was was running at us. We all ran back into the lodge and stayed inside for the rest of the night. True, this could have been a person, but it just doesn't make sense. What were they doing in there that late? What were they doing in there at all? I still think about what it could have been. It doesn't help that my cousins don't even remember. So there's a mountain range known as Kiakonosh separating Poland and the Czech Republic. About eight years ago, I was coming back from Prague to Rocklaw and missed the last bus from the Czech side Harachov to the Poland side Sklaskoporba. It was summer, about 7 p.m., so there was still a lot of light. I decided to cross the mountains through a low pass, figured I'd reach Poland before dawn. The journey had been uneventful until about 2 a.m. That's when I started hearing a high-pitched, wailing sound. It sounded a lot like a whale's call. It felt terribly sad and lonely. I started looking around, searching for its source. The moon was high and the sky was clear, so the visibility was really good. I saw it among the trees, about a 100 meters from me. It was moving slowly, carefully testing the ground before proceeding. Its siren's call made me shiver. The creature looked like a giant spider with a bat's head placed on a long, thin neck. Its ears were huge and probably highly sensitive it turned its head, as if noticing my presence, but it didn't seem to mind me and continued to move slowly and wail. It was about three meters long, one five meter tall. It didn't do anything paranormal except for well existing. What I felt wasn't exactly terror, it was more of awe and profound sadness. I remember thinking it might be the last one of its kind, that its calls had been a dying song. After watching it for a few minutes, I proceeded to follow the trail and eventually reached the town of Sklaska Porba around 5 a.m. I remember feeling really strange for a couple of days afterwards. Hello, something happened last summer that has left me with many questions and few answers. I was employed at an appliance and furniture rental and sales business in Great Bend, Kansas. One morning a co-worker and I opened the store. When we arrived we noticed that the back door was open and when we entered the back room all the lights in the store had been turned on. It didn't look like a break-in because the security latch was intact. The security system had been disabled, there was no power indicator on the code box. We immediately called the police and the store manager to report the situation. We were told not to open the store and to remain in the back office until someone arrived. A few minutes later, after hanging up the phone with the store manager, a police officer was knocking on the back door. I left him in and told him what we had found when we arrived. The officer started to walk through the back room and into the showroom when we started to hear a baby cry. I thought that a customer may have somehow entered the store and that they had a baby with them. My co-worker and I followed the officer in the direction of the crying well. I didn't believe what I saw. There were two babies lying on a twin-size bed display. The officer told us to stay there while he checked the rest of the store. He had also radioed for another police officer to come to the location. 
I looked down at the babies who were both tightly wrapped in dark green cloth. Both babies were quiet, very still, and looking at me and my co-worker. I was taken aback by their odd eyes. Both babies had large pupils that were black. There were no irises and neither of the babies blinked. The police officer was soon back with us. He commented on the baby's eyes as well. In fact, he was totally freaked out so much so that he looked scared. The store manager soon arrived as well as a senior police officer. We all stood around the bed looking at these strange babies who lay there quietly watching us. The store manager pulled my co-worker and me to the side and told us to go ahead and leave. He was not opening the store until he found out what was going on. We quickly headed toward the back door and left. I wasn't scheduled to work until a couple days later but I had talked to a few co-workers who said that the atmosphere in the store was very strange. They had been receiving weird telephone calls and the security system alarm would trip on several times during the day. I got to work a little early for my next scheduled shift. When I arrived, the store manager was sitting in the office, so I asked him what had happened after we had left. He said that two young women, who said they were from the municipal court, eventually showed up and took the babies. The senior police officer told him later that he had no idea who the women were, but that he was told by his superior not to impede. He thought they were probably from McConnell AFB in Wichita. He also said that the babies were very quiet and seemed relaxed the entire period that they were there. I stopped working there not long after. Things were just never the same, and it got tougher each day, especially when odd-looking people would come into the store and just walk around. I didn't feel comfortable being there. February or March, I think. 1988 or 1989. Maybe 1990, but I doubt it. There were four adults and three older children in the car. We were waiting for Antrak to show up. It was close to dusk. Something came across our viewway across the tracks. Maybe 200 feet away. I could be wrong about the distance. On the far side was the edge of the forest. Walking along the edge of the forest in southerly direction was a big brown hairy creature. At first we thought it was someone in costume, but soon realized it wasn't and that it was a real. There's this stretch of river far north of town that I liked hiking alongside. I'd never seen anyone else out there, and I enjoyed the simplicity and peacefulness of that isolation. One morning, I took my dog with me, and we were crossing a shallow stretch of the river while she was tethered to my belt. She's a calm, friendly dog, hardly ever barks, and is always happy to meet strangers and other creatures. But when we reached the middle of the river, she suddenly started barking and jumping around on a tether like something was coming at us. I swiveled around and saw that she was just barking at some middle-aged guy in an oversized red t-shirt standing on the riverbank we'd just left. At first I was relieved that it wasn't a mountain lion or bear, so I waved to him and said hello. But he just kept standing there staring at us without any expression on his face. Meanwhile my dog kept snarling barking and pulling at her leash like she wanted to get free to go kill him, completely uncharacteristic of her. I tried to get her to calm down, but she was lost in her fury, so I just started slogging my way towards the other riverbank, towing her behind me. I kept glancing back at the guy and saw that he'd started pacing up and down the riverbank still watching us. I waved to him again and told him to have a good day, stranger, but again he didn't acknowledge it just kept pacing and then stopping to stand there staring at us. Dog kept going nuts with the barking and snarling until we climbed up the other river bank and put a few layers of trees and rocks and foliage between us and the guy. The rest of the hike, whenever she'd tense up and perk her ears up and look off into the woods, I'd get a bit paranoid and fish the folding knife out of my pocket in case. It was the red shirt guy following us and not just some little critter drawing her attention took a roundabout, long way back to my car that crossed the river in a different spot from where we'd seen him. 
I want to preface before that I've always somewhat believed in these type of creatures, aliens, skinwalkers, windigos, spirits, etc. But I've always been the kind of person who doesn't 100% believe or not in something. I've just always believed that it's possible, so why not? But of course, just like anyone else who hasn't experienced something, I had my doubts. Also, I wanted to add that I am not the type to be scared of entities. When it comes to what I believe and how I see spirits, I am never scared of them. I understand them and I have always connected with them. Last night, I was with my partner and our friend and we were at a place called Rafe's Chasms in Gloucester, Massachusetts. We got there at about 9.30 p.m. and we were just going to have a fire on the rocks by the water. You had to walk through some wooded area to get to the rocks and as we pulled up to the area I had a bad feeling for some reason and usually trust my intuition but I told myself I was just psyching myself out. Once we got to the spot I immediately felt a weird feeling but again I told myself I was just making things up. Even so I didn't turn my back to the open space and I was turned facing towards the woods or rock area. As the people I were with watched the fire I stared out into the darkness feeling like something was watching us. I decided to go to a rock further away from the fire so my eyes could adjust to the darkness. And lo and behold, I see a translucent white figure about 50 feet away from us on top of the rocks on the other side of the area pretty high up. It was moving back and forth and it looked about five, six feet tall. It starts to scale down the rocks and when I say scale, I mean fast like faster than humanly possible and as it's doing that it gets smaller and turns into the shape of an animal like a coyote or wolf shapeshifters usually are said take form as one of these. I say, is that an animal? And my partner looks over and immediately gets super sketched out just as I was. The other person we were with wasn't bothered by it for some reason. He said he saw it, but in the moment was trying to convince us it was a person. He was drunk as I see it coming towards us. I get absolutely horrified that it's going to kill us. I tried to go up higher on the rocks to get away from it. I literally thought that was it. I thought I was going to die. I had the most horrifying feeling, and it was genuinely the scariest, most terrifying thing I have ever felt or seen. I pulled out my phone and shined my flashlight on it to make sure I'm not tripping. And I think that it deterred whatever it was away from us because it ended up running into the woods and disappearing. My partner and I were completely horrified and my legs were violently shaking. I said that we need to leave immediately. The friend that we were with wanted to stay to finish his drink, but we wanted to go. He told us that he would prove that it was a human by trying to run down the rocks as fast as he could to prove that a human could go that fast but when he did we could hear him running around. And that's the scary part about what we saw. It was completely silent as it went down the rocks and back up them. We weren't able to process what had happened until we had gotten home after we dropped our friend off. When we did we decided to do some research about skinwalkers and the area where we were. Here's what we found. The first few things that come up when you Google Rafe's Chasm in Gloucester is several articles of deaths that have occurred right where we were. Now each one states that the deaths were from the waves knocking the people off and drowning them. But this wasn't what freaked us out. I continued to scroll and I came across this weird website. It was a website for stock photos, but for some reason the description included the name of the location we were. When I clicked the website I literally could not believe what I saw. Proof is attached the image of whatever creature that has looked a lot like what we had seen earlier that night. We still have no idea what to make of this situation, but all I know is I am still scared. Also, needed to add that earlier in the night I heard an owl, and I made sure I said something about it to my friend and partner because I love owls. I just heard one woo. I later in the night read that an owl is the eyes for the walkers which is very interesting as anyone else experienced something like this. Thanks for listening yet another episode of Nightmare Hours. If you love our stories, do hit that subscribe button. Good night folks and see you tomorrow at the same time.